Well, good day and welcome back. Today we're going to be looking at Paul's instruction to the families, including husbands and wives, children, and we're also going to be looking at, for a short time, the relationships Paul instructed about and the interaction between slaves and masters. <clears throat> but before we get started, let's go ahead and open in prayer. Lord, we, uh, we give you this. We give you this study that we have today, Father, so that you can work in our lives with it. I pray that we're never the same when we open your word, Father, when we look at the things that you have um, inspired for writers to put down, in this particular case, the Apostle Paul. Now, as we look at how you designed the family to function together, Father, I just pray that we take that to heart that where we have failed in our familiar relationships, Father, that we can correct that, that we can look to, toward your Son, Father, as the greatest example of the sacrifice and submission and in the relationship with others and employees, as relationship with employees and employers, Father, that we can uh, always remember that we're doing this to serve you and to give glory to you. As we open your word, we pray that it's blessed and that you're glorified as we do so. Pray these things in your holy name. Amen. So, there are a few areas of modern life that have been more distorted, corrupted, and just changed and altered by the devil and the world itself and caused the church more problems than those of marriage and the family itself. Verse 21 that we just spoke about last week in our previous study, briefly, um, Paul began instruction on mutual submission to other believers in the body of Christ. Now in verses uh, 5, chapter 5, verses 22 through chapter 6, verses 4, he expands and clarifies that idea when it comes to the family relationship and the family structure together. And then in a few verses, chapter 5, verses, excuse me, chapter 5, 6 verses 5 through 9 he's we'll look at the how Paul spoke on the relationship between a servant and a master first off i want to mention what paul has already discussed in previous writings there are no classifications no ranking structure between Christians. None are higher better or somehow more important than any other christian in acts 10 verses 34 and 35 it's recorded Peter began to speak. Now, I truly understand that God doesn't show favoritism, but in every nation, the person who fears him and does what is right is acceptable to him. And Paul himself recorded in Romans 2.11, for there is no favoritism with God. There is no difference in value or worth people or privilege and rights among God's people. But when it comes to roles and functions, God does differentiate. God has given governments and officials authority over people they rule. Church leaders have given, been given authority and responsibility over their congregations. To husbands, he has given authority and responsibility over and for their wives. He has given parents authority and responsibility over their children. And he has given employers authority over their employees. So I'm going to start by reading Ephesians chapter 5, verses 22 through the end of the chapter, which is 33. Wives, submit to your husbands as to the Lord, because the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ is the head of the church. He is the Savior of the body. Now, as the church submits to Christ, so also wives are to submit to their husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives, just as Christ loved the church and gave himself for her to make her holy, cleansing her with the washing of water by the word. He did this to present the church to himself in splendor, without spot or wrinkle or anything like that, but holy and blameless. In the same way, husbands are to love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself, for no one ever hates his own flesh, but provides and cares for it just as Christ does for the church, since we are members of his body. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. This mystery is profound, but I am talking about Christ and the church. To sum up, each one of you is to love his wife as himself, and the wife is to respect her husband. The definition of submit. 
to subordinate, to be under obedience, and what I view as the most important part, to submit self unto. It is a self-submission. The submission that is called for by Paul here is to be a voluntary response to God's will by giving up your own rights to other believers in general and to ordain authority in the case of a wife to her husband. In verse 21 that we looked at just momentarily last in our last week's study, right before Paul's instruction here to the families, he says that submitting to one another in the fear of Christ. That's Ephesians 5 verse 21. Nobody ever makes a racket about that one when God calls on us as believers to submit ourselves to other believers. It's the exact same word that was used in verse 21 that is used here in verse 22, instructing us to submit to every other believer. But nobody cares about that. Why? It's because it doesn't raise the political and social ire that this one does when wives are instructed to submit to their husbands. Most people, especially non-believers, don't even think about, not even aware that there's another verse there that tells us to submit to everybody. But this verse says for wives to submit to their own husbands or your own husband. 1 Corinthians 7, 3 through 4 says, A husband should fulfill his marital duty to his wife, and likewise, a wife to her husband. A wife does not have the right over her own body, but her husband does. In the same way, a husband does not have the right over his own body, but his wife does. Husbands and wives should have a mutual possessiveness when it comes to each other, while at the same time practicing a mutual submissiveness to each other. The word used here in verse 22 for submit is not the same word that is used for obey that Paul goes on and speaks here in a few verses when he tells children to obey their parents. It is not the same word. Obey means to heed or confirm to a command or authority. A husband is not to treat his wife as either a servant or as a child, but instead as an equal, which God has given him care and responsibility for provision and protection over the submission here is a willful submission to an authority that God has already established. God created man and women differently for different roles and responsibilities in the family and in society. We in our society are under attack to say and act like there are no differences between the sexes. There is a worldwide attempt to remove all distinctions between men and women and this is nothing more than an attack by Satan meant to undermine God and his plan of ordained authority in government, education, church, and the family. God doesn't make mistakes. Genesis 1.27 says, So God created man in his own image. He created him in the image of God. He created them male and female. And Genesis 5 verses 1 and 2 say, This is the document containing the family records of Adam. On the day that God created man, he made him in the likeness of God. He created them male and female. When they were created, he blessed them and called them mankind. People, God doesn't make mistakes and his plan does not change. You can, and when I say you, anybody out there can, and I see that our government is trying to just do away with the sexes, whole changing, trying to change things where there is no male and female. You can even get in some places don't even put male or female on their driver's license. You can identify any way that you want, but God created you a particular way, and that was what you were intended to be. Doing away with pronouns such as him, her, he, she doesn't change what God created. Again, this is nothing more than Satan doing everything he can to distort what God created, and man is following him down that path wholeheartedly. The word wives here that Paul uses is not qualified and applies to every Christian wife, regardless of her social standing, education, intelligence, spiritual gifting, or maturity. Nor is the instruction to submit to the husbands qualified by the husband's intelligence, character, attitude, spiritual condition, or any other consideration. 1 Peter 3, verses 1 and 2 say, In the same way, wives, submit yourselves to your own husbands so that, even if some disobey the word, they may be won over without a word by the way their wives live when they observe your pure, reverent lives. God doesn't call on missionary dating or marrying. 
But if you have made the decision, which is a selfish decision, if you followed your own will, not God's, to enter into this relationship of marriage, your responsibility is to live your life the way God calls you so that you can be an influence on your husband. And it is the same way for husbands. If you made a mistake not following God's will to enter into a relationship and a marriage, it is still your responsibility to follow God's instruction irregardless of the rights or the the fact that your spouse does not deserve what God calls them. None of us deserve it. It takes grace in Christ by the filling of the Holy Spirit, which we talked about in verse 18, just a few before, to restore the created order and harmony of proper submission in a relationship that has been, been corrupted and misaligned by sin and Satan himself. And don't miss the second part of the verse, people. It says, submit as unto the Lord. Women, you cannot be expected to submit to your husband because he deserves it, because none of us do. Everything that we do, wives or husbands, parents or children, employees, employers, servants, masters, Gentile, Jew, everything that we do should be to God's glory and done as unto him. Sometimes those that we submit to may be thoughtless, inconsiderate, abusive, and ungrateful. But the spirit-filled believer submits anyway because we are instructed to and we do it as unto God. A wife who submits to her husband is first submitting to God. Paul treats this relationship between a husband and wife as an inseparable union. So sacred and so blessed, it is the symbol of the relationship between Christ and his church. And his view seems to show that the family is the only room in which the rights of womanhood can best be protected and maintained. The wife's supreme motive for submitting to her husband is because of the fact that he is her functional head in the family, just as Christ is the head of the church. The head gives direction and the body responds. The wife who submits this way is a beautiful testimony to the Lord in view of all the world around her. We have spoken of this example before, but Jesus himself is the ultimate example of submission in submitting to the Father's will. He submitted in the supreme act of submission by giving his own sinless life to save a sinful world. He is the perfect provider, protector, and head of his church. And he is the divine role model for husbands as well who should provide, protect, and preserve, love, and lead their wives. Just as the church submits to Christ, so the wife should submit to her husband. And then now Paul turns to the the reciprocal responsibilities of the husband here. That was not the view in the Greco-Roman society of that time. Christianity introduced a revolutionary approach to marriage that equalized the rights of wives and husbands and established a better foundation than it was on before, and it's better because it was God's plan. Whereas the primary word for wives is submit, for husbands the primary word is love. This is the selfless type of love. The Greek word agape or agapao, which means charity and literally means a party of love. It is This is the highest and a distinctly Christian view of love, this word for love that is used here. The word Paul uses is insisting that the love of a Christian man for his wife must be a response to and an expression of the love of God in Christ, which was extended to the church. Colossians 3.19 says, Husbands, love your wives and don't be bitter toward them. Going back to Genesis at the time of creation again, chapter 2 of Genesis 21 through 24 says this, So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to come over the man, and he slept. God took one of his ribs and closed the flesh at that place. Then the Lord God made the rib he had taken from the man into a woman and brought her to the man. And the man said, This one at last is bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. This one will be called woman, for she was taken from man. This is why a man leaves his father and mother and bonds with his wife, and they become one flesh. People, man in general, the husband, cannot mistreat a woman if he has chosen her and looks at her in the way that God designed us as his own flesh. In verse 25, Paul again draws a comparison between man's relationship with his wife and Christ's relationship with the church. Jesus gave himself up for the church on the cross, and husbands should be willing to give themselves for their wives. In Romans 4.25, Paul says that Jesus gave himself up for our sins or for us all. Well, in Galatians 2.20, Scripture says he gave himself for me. 
Now he makes it clear that Christ gave himself for her, the her being his church. In verse 26, Paul clarifies that Jesus made that sacrifice to make the church holy, cleansing her with the washing of water by the word. To make holy is to set apart. And he did this by his death upon the cross. Christ intended to separate for himself a people for his own possession, the church. And to be holy and set apart, the church required cleansing. We are not cleansed at the time of salvation. We, the cleansing begins. The term cleansing emphasizes the act of bathing, not the bath itself. The reference is to baptism and obviously refers to that regenerative washing spoken of in Titus. Titus 3 verses 4 and 5 says, But when the kindness of God our Savior and his love for mankind appeared, he saved us, not by works of righteousness that we had done, but according to his mercy through the washing of regeneration and renewal by the Holy Spirit. And we've spoken of this in previous studies. That is a continual renewal and regeneration. This in no way applies or hints that the mere act or application of water could in any way of itself bring about the purification referred to. The word referred to in this bathing in the Cleansing that is referred to here probably refers to the words that Jesus instructed when in Matthew 28, 19, he says, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. The word itself does not do the cleansing. The Holy Spirit does because of Jesus' sacrifice. Jesus did all of this to present the church to himself, the bride to the groom as a pure virgin. 2 Corinthians 11.2 says, For I am jealous for you with a godly jealousy, because I have promised you in marriage to one husband, to present a pure virgin to Christ. And Revelations 21 verses 2 says, I also saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared like a bride, adorned for her husband. The church is the bride of Christ. And a husband cannot redeem his wife quite the way that Jesus redeemed his church. But his love, Paul instructs here, is to be that like that love that Christ did for his bride, pure and self-sacrificing. Paul says that just as scripture says a man and woman are to become one in flesh in marriage, Genesis 2.24, again reading that, this is why a man leaves his father and mother and bonds with his wife and they become one flesh. So man should love his wife as if she is his own flesh, because she is. So intimate is the relationship between a husband and his wife that they are fused into one entity. So much for that individuality thing that is taught by a common man. We are not to be two separate people in marriage. We are one person. We are to be one flesh with two separate roles. A wife is not to be treated as a piece of property as they were in Paul's day, but she is to be regarded as an extension of a man's own personality and so a part of himself. It's self-evident that no one has ever hated themselves. A person usually spends time caring for their own body, feeding itself, and looking after its health. Jesus cares for the church this way because Christians are living parts of his body. This is where Paul quotes the scripture from Genesis 2, 23 and 24, and the man says, This one at last is bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. This one will be called woman, for she was taken from man. Adam recognized there that woman is part of his own flesh, and then he responds in, uh, in verse 24, saying it is right for a man to leave his parents and to become one with the woman. Jesus even quoted this when questioned by some Pharisees about the circumstances warning divorce. He was speaking about the fact that divorce was only given because man's heart is sinful, but it was not God's original intent. Mark 10, verses 6 through 9 but from the beginning, this is Jesus speaking, but from the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother, and the two will become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let no one separate. This was not God's plan, this thing of divorce. Marriage is supposed to be taken seriously and it is supposed to be permanent. The marriage ties take precedence over every other human relationship. This divine ordinance that God has given was given and designed for mutual satisfaction and delight among husband and wife. 
This mystery that's spoken of that he mentions here in the verses in Ephesians has already been addressed by Paul previously. It refers to a biblical truth or revelation made known through a special dispensation of grace. This time, in relation to Genesis 2.24, it means that for Christ the groom to win his bride, the church, he had to sacrifice himself on the cross. This is the mystery that is being spoken of here. And then the final word given by Paul in this section of his letter is a practical one. His readers need to grasp the essential instruction that he has just given them. He addresses each husband individually. Each one of you, each one of you, you are to continue loving your wife just as you love yourself. It is a continual thing. And the wives are to revere their husbands. Or another word for that is to respect. This is wise counsel and a guide for prospective brides. If you can't respect and submit to the man that you are marrying, then don't bother marrying them. And men and women are to act this way regardless of their spouse and whether their spouse deserves it because of the fear and the love of God that should be in the relationship. Now let's look at a few verses here in Ephesians chapter 6. I'm going to read verses 1 through 4 to start with. Children, obey your parents in the Lord because this is right. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with a promise, so that it may go well with you and that you may have a long life in the land. Fathers, don't stir up anger to your children, but bring them up in the training and instruction of the Lord. And I have to tell you, I was kind of strange as a child, and that hasn't changed much. But although I was not what you would call the perfect child by any sense and wasn't um, didn't spend time in the Word as I should, I did take um, specific pleasure sometimes in reading about how God designed the family and the roles. Um, I believed even back then in the biblical principles that were put forth in Scripture as to how families are to relate to each other and how we are supposed to obey. And sometimes this annoyed my brother, who, by the way, is now a pastor, but it annoyed him when I would point it out in the presence of my parents. I specifically remember one trip. We were coming back from a family conference in Chattanooga, Tennessee, where I had first Bible that I had personally bought for myself. Um, I can recall spending my own money on this particular Bible, and I was reading from Proverbs. I enjoyed reading from Proverbs and driving my brother crazy. Verses like Proverbs 1.8, listen, to my son, to your father's instruction and don't reject your mother's teaching. And then Proverbs 22.6, start a youth out on his way. Even when he grows old, he will not depart from it. I think even back then I was smart enough to avoid that scripture about sparing the rod and spoil the child because I can promise you this, my father was very familiar with that scripture. People, where I think society has lost its first, has first become lost, besides obviously not believing in the whole word of God, is how we have lost control of and don't adhere to the biblical principles of the family. When Paul says for children to obey their parents, he means it. There's no iffy thing that is placed in scripture. The Greek means to listen attentively and to heed or conform to a command or authority. And he doesn't say to do this if your parents are good, if you agree with the decision that they're making, he says to obey them. And that word honor that's in the verse means to place value on, to revere, esteem, or dignify. Now, just as a wife should not be waiting to see if her husband deserves it before she submits, as scripture tells us, so children are not called to wait until their parents deserve it or are worthy of their respect or obedience. There's no caveat in the scripture that Paul gives there. My wife, uh, prior to us getting married, prior to her even um, giving in to, I will say, to my marriage proposal, um, she felt that I should speak to her father. Now, her father lived in Virginia, and we lived in Central Florida. But she believed, even though her father did not always um, show the best biblical principles as far as how a parent is supposed to be, she believed that even in that, we were still commanded by Scripture to honor our parents. And so before she would even consider 
accepting my marriage proposal, she insisted on us driving to Virginia and me meeting her father because she felt that was the honorable thing to do. So we did do that. Just as the command for wives to submit and husbands to love is an incumbent upon the recipient being worthy of that love or respect, esteem, and submission, so the command here to obey isn't based on the worthiness of the parent to receive that obedience and honor. We as parents are human, and there isn't a one of us that is perfect. God is the only perfect parent. But we are again given responsibility and authority in this relationship of the family, and God says we are to be obeyed and honored. But the parent-child relationship isn't one-sided here either. The gospel introduced a new element into parental responsibility, just as it did in the relationship between a husband and a wife. The feelings of the child must be taken into consideration. Above all else, Paul warns fathers not to goad their children into a state of resentment. He is speaking of everyday tensions that exist within a family. Father, fathers must not make unreasonable demands, otherwise children may become disheartened. Colossians 3.21 says, Fathers, do not exasperate your children so that they won't become discouraged. We have to be careful in how we raise our children. Psalms 127.4 tells us that children are a heritage from the Lord and are to be reared for Him. It says, Like arrows in the hand of a warrior are the sons born in one's youth. The, the bring up that it says in verse 4b, the second part of that is to bring up the children. It's in Ephesians 6 here that we're looking up. The bring up means to rear up to maturity and to cherish and train. And the two things that Paul mentions here with that rearing are training and instruction. Training here means the strict discipline, and Paul is referring to training in righteousness. And the instruction that he refers to is correction by the word of mouth. This includes correction and reproof, as well as advice and encouragement that we are called upon to give our children. This should be the beginning of Christian education within the home, not at the church. It should begin within the home and within the family relationship. Now, moving on to the relationships between servants and their masters. Ephesians 6, 5 through 9 says, Slaves, obey your human masters with fear and trembling in the sincerity of your heart as you would Christ. Don't work only while being watched as people pleasers, but as slaves of Christ, do God's will from your heart. Serve with a good attitude as to the Lord and not to people, knowing that whatever good each one does, slave or free, he will receive this back from the Lord. And masters, treat your slaves the same way without threatening them, because you know that both their master and yours is in heaven, and there is no favoritism with him. That is Ephesians 6, verses 5 through 9. The word for slave here, or more accurately, probably uses more connotation with the term servant. The original Greek word does come from the term bind or bonds, and it definitely implies some sort of servitude. In both Greek and Roman societies at the time, slaves had no rights and were treated as commercial commodities. They were bought, sold, traded, and treated heartlessly. Considerate masters during that time were actually an exception. Scripture does not speak directly against slavery as such, but it does speak against kidnapping anyone for the purpose of slavery. Exodus 21.16 says, Whoever kidnaps a person must be put to death, whether he sells him or the person is found in his possession. Thus, because of that instruction, the European and American slave trade that existed up until the middle of the 19th century was a sin, no matter how hard some trish Christians of that time tried to rationalize it. Pastor Marcus recently addressed some types of non-abusive and beneficial servitude that was permitted, such as in the case of a criminal who could not pay restitution. He was placed into servitude until restitution was made. That would be beneficial much more so than our current um, system of corrections that is established here in the U.S., where a person is actually responsible for their actions and actually has to make restitution for it. Fellow Israelites could even sell themselves into servitude, but they were to be treated as workers until being released in the year of Jubilee, Scripture tells us. Even pagan slaves, it says in Scripture, aren't to be mistreated. Although slavery is not actually condemned in either the Old or the New Testament, if we apply New Testament principles and truth to our lives, it will eliminate the abuse of slavery. 
New Testament teaching does not seek to reform or restructure human systems because they are not the root cause of human problems. The issue is the human heart. If men's hearts are not changed, they will find a way to oppress others whether slavery is legal or not. Quoting John MacArthur in one of his commentaries, he says, Man's basic problems and needs are not political, social, or economic, but spiritual, and that is the area on which Paul concentrates. Slaves and servants are to obey their masters whether they are good or not because they are only earthly masters. The Christian slave has a heavenly Lord just as the master does to whom he owns, owes his supreme allegiance. Respect and fear, or fear and trembling, it says in Scripture, depending on your translation, is not to be confused with a craven willingness to serve, but should show a sense of recognition of our shortcomings and an attempt to do our best and to not make a mistake in the relationship as a worker or as a servant. And the sincerity, it says, to be done here implies a concentration on purpose. We are supposed to be doing, just as other scripture tells us, everything that we do as unto the Lord. The obedience here has one goal, to obey his human master as an expression of his commitment to his heavenly Lord. And this service was to be conducted whether anyone was looking or not, it says. Slaves or servants weren't just out to win the favor of men or people that see them working hard, but favor of the Lord. They were slaves of Christ first. Jesus himself took the form of a slave and washed the feet of his disciples. And their service was to be rendered with genuine goodwill. And this service wasn't to be done seeking freedom, but instead realizing that this service would be rewarded by God in end times. And again, the relationship is not one-sided. Masters were to treat their servants or slaves well. The golden rule is basically applied here. Masters were to treat their slaves the way that they would want to be treated. The common factor here between masters and servants should be seeking to do the will of God. Christian masters were to be different in how they treated their slaves by treating them kindly and fairly. Christian master, masters and Christian servants realize that they all serve a heavenly Lord to whom they equally belong. The word favoritism literally means to look at or to see someone before deciding how to treat them. People, God has no teacher's pets. We are all to treat each other equally, even if these practices don't apply, and it's referred to in the employer and employee relationships. We are to do everything with recognition that we all serve the same heavenly Lord to whom we all actually belong in the first place. Thank you for spending time this morning with God's word and pray that you are blessed by the opening of his word. Thank you and have a great day.